first of all, thank you for inviting me to speak tonight. Uh, my old friend uh, Lowell has uh, invited me. So if uh, you're dissatisfied at the end, you can um, complain to him. Um, I am uh, speaking tonight on uh, my new favorite bird, uh, the yellow-billed magpie. And uh, I might just mention a little bit about myself. I'm a uh, ornithologist, wildlife biologist, retired now. And that gives me a lot of time to uh, conduct research on bird species. And I work on uh, a variety of species here in the valley and the foothills, uh, including uh, purple martin, which I've been doing for, uh, it seems like, eons, uh, tricolored blackbird, and uh, Swainson's hawk, osprey, and uh, this one is kind of my latest uh, pet project. Um, as COVID hit and some of my other studies that were citizen science dependent got um, canceled, I uh, looked around as a way to get out of my house and I have magpies living in, in fact, a pair of nesting in my backyard in a big redwood tree. And I thought, you know, I don't really know very much about these birds. Um, let me just start paying attention and collecting some data. And the study gradually grew from there. It's not a, uh, you know, sort of your classic scientific study where you establish a, a, a hypothesis to test at the beginning. Uh, it's a natural history study. Um, so what I'm going to do tonight is give you a rundown of this uh, study that's now going into its third year and uh, hopefully uh, teach you a little bit about magpies that uh, you haven't known. Uh, so here are the topics tonight. Uh, first, just a quick overview of magpie, uh, yellow bell magpie status and ecology. Uh, then we're going to talk about habitat use uh, studies that I've done looking at population status uh, in the Sacramento urban area. Uh, I'm also going to talk about a population habitat model, uh, which I've developed based on the uh, looking at the habitat conditions and the populations that I've found, and then talk a little about conservation implications uh, for the species. So, um, and, and I should note, you know, this study is uh, focused on the urban Sacramento area, but I am sure that there are a lot of parallels to uh, other cities in the Central Valley. Um, so, you know, there should be lessons that you can apply uh, in your local area there in Fresno. Um, you know, first of all, you know, magpie is a beautiful bird and it's widely recognized by the general public and, and liked by the public. Uh, many symbols, uh, it's, it is used as symbols in many cases uh, for cities and towns and parks and things. Um, so it, it's very popular uh, publicly. It uh, is also one of two fully endemic California birds, meaning that uh, no member of this species has been seen outside of the state of California. And I'm not gonna tell you what the second one is. We can uh, guess at that uh, during the question period or you can put it in the chat. Um, it's a bird of limited distribution. As you see in the graph here, uh, it occupies the northern portion of, uh, or I should say, the central and northern portions of the Central Valley and uh, the Central Coast region of California uh, primarily. Uh, another interesting thing about the magpie is it nests in colonies. It seems like every species I study nests in colonies for some reason. Uh, and it forages also in groups, which is uh, actually rather unusual uh, for most songbirds. Um, so why is the magpie a species of conservation concern? Well, uh, it uh, has, it historically was persecuted extensively as a, uh, and poisoned as a, as a perceived uh, predator on livestock. Um, it actually is not a predator on livestock. It is a competitor. I mean, I'm sorry, it is a um, um, scavenger. Um, and so, uh, but you know, people would see stillborn calves and they would see magpies and they would assume uh, that one caused the other. Uh, and in fact, it was the reverse. Um, another historical problem, of course, like most animals in California has been, 
habitat loss due to uh, extensive agricultural conversion and uh, to development. But most recently, the issue with uh, the yellow-billed magpie has been West Nile virus and its effects on its population. So this graph here um, shows you um, uh, two things, the arrival and the incidence of, of West Nile virus uh, shown with the dotted line. And this is based on cases uh, of dead birds, uh, infections, various um, indicators of West Nile virus activity. And then the, the solid line shows you the Elbil magpie abundance as determined through uh, Christmas bird counts. And so beginning uh, with the, uh, the um, West Nile virus arrival, uh, magpie populations declined rapidly. Um, and they have not, unlike many other species that were initially affected, they have not developed resistance. A lot of these things we used to, when I first started talking about them, people didn't know what these things meant. Now we all know, right? Um, the, uh, the virus uh, has caused about an 85% reduction in magpie populations in the Central Valley as of about 2019, when uh, my colleague Ed Pandolfino summarized the Christmas bird count data last. Um, but note several things. The decline pattern is variable. It was rapid at the, at the onset. Uh, it then was gradual, and now it's sort of uh, bottomed out and is remaining somewhat stable, but at this low level. But again, because there's been no resistance developed, uh, the population has not recovered. Um, so what do we know about yellow bill magpies? Um, well, I went into the literature to look for ecological studies as I began, and I discovered that the magpie has been extensively studied, but mainly, and I should really say almost exclusively, in the central coast region of its range. The Central Valley work that's been done has been very limited, um, consisting of population assessments that have been made after West Nile virus, again, documenting these declines uh, with broad scale data from uh, breeding bird surveys, uh, Christmas bird counts, and eBird. Um, but on the ground, ecological stuff is very limited. Uh, four wintering roost sites were described by uh, Scott Crosby as, his, as part of his study uh, documenting the decline of the population at the time of West Nile. And there's really been nothing uh, at all published or studied on foraging and nesting habitats and you know, what determines uh, breeding population size for this species, which seems really quite uh, surprising to me considering how common it is and how it is somewhat of a unique, uh, a species unique to California, but that's, that's basically uh, what it is. So um, I, I wanna give you an introduction to, um, uh, you know, how, kind of how I approach the study. And that involved um, first identifying areas where mag. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, looking at, I'm, I'm describing our goals. The, uh, sorry, the banner is blocking my screen here. Um, first, we wanted to identify where do magpies occur and don't occur because they're rather anomalous in their distribution. And I found, uh, I queried a large number of very knowledgeable birders in this area and nobody could really give me a consistent answer as to what determines where magpies are and where they aren't in the Sacramento region. Um, in order to do this, I described the foraging and nesting habitat that they used. Uh, I determined if habitat conditions determine abundance and what those conditions are. And then finally, uh, I evaluated uh, population trends at least over the last three years. Um, I keep saying I, and I forgot to mention at the beginning of this study that this is a collaboration with uh, my colleagues, Lily Douglas and my daughter, Layla Arola, who I uh, dragged into this as a way to keep get her out and about while, uh, <coughs> while COVID was keeping her home. So um, the initial study sites we chose, again, were these seven sites in Sacramento, all large urban parks, um, 
that had been reported to have large magpie populations. And you, you probably are not too familiar with these sites, but these are very popular birding areas in Sacramento, very well known eBird hotspots, if you will. Um, in, in 2020, I started out by, again, identifying these areas with large populations. We needed to develop a census method. You know, how are we going to count the birds, which sounds straightforward, but isn't necessarily, as I'll explain. Uh, we described nesting and foraging habitat, and then based on that initial data, developed a model that could predict population sizes based on habitat conditions. In 2021, we greatly expanded our survey areas, the number of survey areas. We also, because we picked up a, a sense of the importance of water bodies and different types of water bodies, we evaluated those effects on uh, uh, of availability and water source types on the populations and use this information to further refine the habitat population model. This year, uh, I resurveyed areas to begin to establish a population trend. What is, what is the population doing now that we have three years worth of data? And then I also initiated a, a kind of a specialized study in which uh, we are looking at the effects of a music festival that is being held in Discovery Park, which is the site of the largest yellowbill magpie population by far. And this uh, music festival occurred in the middle of um, the nesting season, in fact, two weekends ago, uh, where 20,000 people came for two days to hear loud music. And we decided to evaluate the effects of that because we really couldn't stop it. Uh, I, I don't have the, the results yet on that. They just, some of them just came to me yesterday, but I can tell you some of my initial uh, uh, ideas based on uh, what I saw as we get more uh, toward, uh, maybe into the, the question section. So what were the conclusions from our, our census testing? I don't wanna go into great detail about what we did, but essentially we had two methods that we used. The first was just simple direct counts. Let's go out and count how many birds we can see. The second was uh, one that used nest counts as a basis for estimating populations. And we did this because we realized when we go out at the right time of year, that is after the birds have put considerable time into building these large uh, cylindrical, uh, or I should say globular nests, but before the, leaf, the trees leaf out, it's very easy to see and count these nests. Um, so, you know, count the nests and multiply by two. And we found that both methods perform generally similarly, but the direct count method required much more effort uh, and it produced rather variable results. You had to go out multiple times because the birds are foraging in groups and moving about. And sometimes you see them and sometimes you don't, and maybe they split up. So it, it produced uh, variable numbers and you had to make multiple trips, whereas the estimates from nest counts are much easier to do and they're also more repeatable. So that's really the method we ended up focusing on. So I'm gonna turn now to talking about uh, hab uh, habitat and in this case, foraging habitat. Wh where did magpies forage and what areas did they select? In or, uh, whoops, to forage in, uh, sorry. So this graph here, I have graphs, you know, I'm a scientist, you can handle it though, I know. Um, this graph here shows you the relative proportion of birds in, in yellow here that used um, various land cover types or habitats within our study area. And it also shows you in orange, the relative proportions of those different land covers, those different habitats within our study area. And if you compare those two things, you can get a sense of which ones are being selected and which ones are being avoided. So in this case, um, what we found is that these two uh, land covers were the ones that magpies uh, foraged in, you know, the great preponderance of time. These, the irrigated turf are your park areas that are irrigated and mowed 
essentially, you know, uh, grass lawn areas in these urban parks. And the second are annual grassland areas if they are mowed or grazed. Um, and if you look at the other ones, you see unmanaged grassland is used at about its, of its proportional availability. Residential areas tend to be avoided, pavement avoided, woodland not used. Kind of interestingly, golf courses are not used um, for reasons I can talk about later, but I won't go into great detail on. And of course, water uh, is not a foraging habitat. Um, so from this, you know, we conclude this lower baseous habitat, the irrigated turf and the mode and annual grazed annual grassland is what the birds are depending on for their foraging. Well, what about nesting? So we looked at uh, 618 nests. You know, it's easy to find nests uh, if you travel around because they are up high and they're highly visible at uh, before the leaves, uh, the trees leaf out. 98% of the nests we found were in trees, about 2% were in uh, cell towers. 89% of the trees they used were deciduous trees. Now, maybe we could see those a little better than in evergreens, but I think nonetheless, the, the great preponderance of, uh, of nest trees are deciduous. Uh, all of the nests are, were located at treetops, such as in this case, in a London plane tree. Um, and usually they were in large and tall trees. We found 14 different species that were used, of which half were native and half, interestingly, to me at least, were non-native. And this differed from the results found in the Central Coast where the birds had nested, uh, were studied in more natural habitats. But uh, Valley Oak made up about a third of the nests and London Plain, this tree here, which is a, a cultivar uh, hybrid of the, uh, our native sycamore and a European sycamore, uh, widely planted in the Central Valley as a, a street tree, uh, that was about a third of the nest. So in short, what we learned is magpies will nest in any tall tree, seemingly preferably deciduous, but they're not tied to native trees. We also uh, described the nests, and this was my daughter's project. Um, we had uh, two nests that fell out of trees, or the trees themselves fell, and we were able to access the nests. Um, so this is the typical structure. One thing characteristic of magpies is they build this dome on top of the nest, and then they have side entrance channels through which they go into the nest. The nests are large, they averaged uh, 16 pounds in weight, and they consist of three layers, something I didn't know. Um, the outer layer is, uh, is all these sticks, which is, protects the nest, but inside there is this massive structure, 3.5 pounds on average uh, of a mud nest that is constructed inside here, and then that mud nest is lined with fine materials. So there's a tremendous amount of work involved in constructing a magpie nest. And I think in particular, and this is gonna become, it, it became important or it was a key to uh, one of our findings is that it, you know, it's particularly difficult to transport 3.5 pounds of mud, one little mud dab at a time. Uh, and that has implications, which I'll describe in a minute. I'll shift gears just uh, for a second here and talk a little bit about uh, population trend at, at our sites. Um, the, we have surveyed, remember I started with eight sites. So if you look at those eight sites over a three year period, you see that the population has stayed sa stable and in fact, slightly increased. I don't know if this is really a significant increase but let's just say the population has been stable at these eight sites, that's 400 pairs. Uh, so it's a pretty good sample size from uh, uh, you know, eight, eight different locations. Uh, the population seem to be stable. If we look at, the, at 13 sites that were surveyed during both 2021 and 2022, same thing, pre pretty, very close. Uh, they are not declining, they are not in trouble in these urban uh, park areas that we're seeing them. So let's turn to looking a bit at the relationship between 
the habitat conditions and the populations. And this kind of crummy uh, fuzzy slide uh, shows you that relationship for the first, uh, the 2020 study sites, those first eight sites. The uh, horizontal axis is the amount of low herbaceous present uh, herbaceous habitat uh, in hectares, which I think is uh, point, what is it, 0.6 uh, uh, acre. Um, and this is the number of magpies. And as you can see, it's, it's a small sample, but it, it indicates some sort of relationship there. And that caused us to follow up further. Well, how would habitat uh, really influence populations? Um, what we found is that population size was correlated with the amount of this irrigated turf and the mowed or grazed annual grassland, this lower herbaceous habitat. And let's remember that that's consistent with what we observe in looking at the birds foraging. The, they forage in those habitats and their populations seem to be tied to the amounts of those habitats. So it, it makes you know, good sense. Uh, in 2021, I wanted to expand on this idea and really test it a little more. And so we uh, went to a larger number of sites. We surveyed 43 sites with various amounts of low herbaceous habitat. And this is an example of one called Howe Park and Santa Ana Parks in Sacramento. Uh, you might be surprised at how urban some of these areas are, but the magpies are nesting in these large trees along the edges of the park, and they're out foraging in these open areas, uh, um, lawn, irrigated lawn areas within the park. Um, one thing that was always a, something that I thought about in the back of my mind is that I know that I knew that there were some large areas of turf in which we had no magpies. And as I began to look at this, I realized that there's appeared to be some sort of influence of water and water availability. So in 2021, we evaluated the effects of different water sources, distances to water, water source types, uh, to see if that had an influence on magpie uh, occupation of areas and on abundance. And then we use this information to refine this sort of uh, habitat population model that I, that I developed. Um, so let's talk about water. Um, and this graph shows you the importance of flowing water. Uh, in, I've taken all the sites and designated whether the sites that I surveyed and designated whether they were occupied in yellow or not occupied in orange. And we classified those as to whether they were near flowing water, you know, um, rivers, uh, streams, whether they were near ponds or whether there was no water nearby. And I think that was within a half a mile. Um, and what you see here is pretty obvious that the areas near flowing water, if they had at least four hectares, which is 10 acres of this low herbaceous habitat, they tended to be, uh, most of them were occupied. Whereas it really didn't matter how much habitat you had, if you were away from water, there likely uh, were, would, would not be magpies. And in the few instances where we did have magpies, I think there was a secret water source like pet uh, watering or livestock watering that we didn't find. In any case, flowing water seems to be a very important um, uh, a component of the habitat. So why is it important? Well, I think there are three possible ideas. The first is obvious that uh, magpies drink regularly. They need water and flowing water is fresh water and healthy. Um, so that may be better. The second harkens back to what I talked about with respect to the use of mud in the nests. And areas of flowing water are um, sources of mud because the edges oftentimes of rivers and streams have an open ready source of mud that's available for the birds to take. Whereas in many of the ponds in some of these parks are either have um, cement sides and no mud or they're overgrown with dense vegetation uh, and, and not accessible. So 
the source of mud, I think, seems to be a really important component. A, a third is that flowing water doesn't support mosquitoes and thus West Nile virus. So it may be that uh, at least it, water is not doing any harm for, with the virus if it's flowing and perhaps ponds uh, are, not, uh, are still producing some mosquitoes despite the efforts of the mosquito abatement uh, people. So this is what the graph looks like when we add in all 41 uh, or 43 sites. Um, if, if we use the sites that are near uh, flowing water. And you can see, you know, this is a kind of relationship you don't get to see very often in ecology. Uh, a single variable, or in this case, maybe two variables, uh, you know, the amount of this low herbaceous habitat, remember lawns or mowed or grazed grassland, and the number of magpies. And that is a, uh, a very uh, uh, sharp and clear relationship. And from that, you can develop a model that is sort of predictive of how many magpies you should get based on the amount of herbaceous habitat. So I'm showing, I'm being daring enough to show an equation to an Audubon you know, group. But I really think you guys are up to this and you can handle it. And if you can't, I'm gonna explain it in English in just a moment. But here's the model. It says the number of magpies at a site uh, is equal to 6.5 roughly times the amount in, eight, in hectares of low herbaceous habitat minus a constant of 19.14. So what does that mean? Well, first of all, that, that, if you, that, that is a regression equation, which is a technique used in statistics. Um, and we can calculate the significance of that relationship, which tells you how strong it is and whether it differs from some sort of random you know, distribution of, of numbers or in the relationship. And this uh, relationship shows an R squared, which is the measure of strength of the relationship of 0.62, which is highly significant. So this is a real uh, and a strong uh, relationship. And what it shows uh, in, in plain English is that near flowing water, as the area of foraging habitat increases, magpie populations increase. But it also tells you some other things. It says that the minimum, it tells you that the minimum area of low herbaceous habitat required to support a nesting magpie pair is three hectares or seven and a half acres. But magpies don't really occur as single pairs. So if you want to know what it takes to support the smallest colony that we found in our surveys, which was three pairs, that would be four hectares or 10 acres. So if you have less than 10 acres of, of this uh, low herbaceous habitat near, um, even if it's near water, you aren't going to find magpies. Doesn't matter how much you have, if you're far from water, you also won't have magpies. So I did all this analysis and then somebody said, well, why don't you make a graph? And I thought, oh, okay. And, and I realized this is a lot easier way to convey the information. If you look at this, the, the circles represent areas that have at least that four hectares of habitat. The squares have less than four hectares, less than 10 acres. The, the blue areas are occupied sites. The red areas are unoccupied. So just simply looking at this, what you can see is that the sites that are occupied are predominantly those sites with at least four hectares that are located right along flowing streams. And, the, and those that have less than four hectares that are occupied are also on streams. When you get less than four hectares, even if you're by a stream, you oftentimes do not get magpies. And if you're, more, if you're away from a stream, forget it. You aren't going to have them no matter how much habitat you have. All of these areas have more than four hectares. So in very simple terms, it explains exactly what's going on here in a way that, as I said at the beginning, no one that I talked to predicted anything like this. I got, my prediction was, oh, it's leftover uh, nut crops from or old orchards. That's where the birds are. Somebody else said, oh, no, it's big oak trees. They only like oak trees. 
anyway, we solved, we, as far as I'm concerned, we solved the mystery in Sacramento, and I would predict that it would also be true in, in um, Fresno, uh, as well as other valley towns. So what are some of the implications of our study? Well, a major question that comes from this is how can a population uh, that is strongly affected by West Nile virus also be showing a strong habitat population relationship? That generally doesn't make sense. Um, and, and the way you would have to explain it is one, that West Nile virus could be affecting all populations proportionate to their abundance. So no matter what the size of the population, um, you know, the same percentage of birds are being removed by West Nile virus. Now, if I told you that three years ago, you might think, well, yeah, that makes sense. Um, but we're all COVID people now. We know that, you know, the incidence of the virus is dependent on the population uh, and density. And so it should not be linear and we should be seeing uh, a stronger COVID effect, I mean COVID, a stronger West Nile virus effect um, that upsets this relationship between habitat and population. So the alternate explanation that, and I can't think of another, is that sites near flowing water are simply not as affected by West Nile virus and that they may serve as refugia from the West Nile virus disease. Um, this would allow the population sizes to be determined by the amount of foraging habitat. Sort of a corollary of this is that uh, it may well be that mosquito control measures that are occurring in urban areas, which of course are get urban areas get clustered near uh, rivers, um, that these mosquito control measures that are you know intended to protect humans are actually protecting and benefiting magpies. This is another you know, potential reason why we may not be seeing a West Nile virus effect. So let me show you these graphs, which illustrates, you know, my studies occurred mostly in the urban corridor of Sacramento in these larger parks that have been conserved along the Sacramento River, the American River, uh, and some other larger streams. This is a map of Sacramento County. The, uh, this is from the Breeding Bird Atlas, and it shows you to the uh, occurrence of breeding magpies during two periods. At the bottom here, you see the first period was uh, the, the atlas done by Tim Manolis back in, uh, led by Tim Manolis back in 1988 and 19, to 1993. And this one uh, is the most recent one that was recently published uh, by Central Valley Bird Club, uh, Ed Pandolfino, Tim, uh, Lily Douglas, and Chris Kennard. And what you see here is a dramatic, first of all, a dramatic decrease in the distribution of yellow-billed magpies from this early period to the later period. But also note where that decline occurs. The birds are, have, are basically holding fairly strong in the urbanized areas and are decline, have declined dramatically or disappeared from much of the rural areas. Um, so that's supporting the idea that urban magpie populations may well be serving as kind of a, a refugia of a healthy population uh, during this period while uh, the rest of the areas are being more affected by COVID, uh, by West Nile virus, because there aren't as many humans there and the intensity of mosquito control or, or water control to control mosquitoes is not as high. So I think that's what I just said. And I for, just forgot to bring it up. Um, so what are some, what are some other uh, conservation implications here? Well, another is the importance of irrigated turf. Um, you know, turf is generally considered and was considered by me to be poor habitat and wasteful of water. Um, but areas like this at the bottom um, are what the, uh, what the magpies are using clearly, uh, or these grazed uh, herbaceous, uh, I mean, annual grassland areas. 
So restoration of native habitat, which is something I have advocated myself um, in these park areas, at least where it occurs close to flowing water, could result in reductions in the local po magpie population. And so it's not recommended at this time when the population is low and these remaining populations appear to be the stronghold for the species in the valley. Um, and then finally, just as sort of a more general implication, I'll just note that uh, you know the yellow-bill magpie is another example of a species that has adapted to human landscapes but is still vulnerable. Uh, think of purple martins nesting in freeways. Think of tricolored blackbirds nesting in non-native Himalayan blackberry. So we have species that are occurring and using hum human landscapes, but that doesn't mean everything is fine. You know, they are, we have to pay attention to the conditions under which these birds are living. Uh, you know, sort of listen to them about what they need and make sure that we're providing. Uh, for the conditions uh, that are important to them in the present, as opposed to some period in the past. They, in essence, they've adapted to us and we need to adapt more to them. Uh, as a declining endemic species, uh, mag the magpie is worthy of increased research and in my opinion, conservation effort. So I think that ends it for me and I'm happy to uh, take any questions that you might have. Uh, and uh, which I believe are coming up in the chat here. Let me see if I can unshare. Okay. All right, Rachel, have you got anything? Um, I'm just looking through here. Um, I'm not seeing any questions yet. So anyone, if you, oh, here, oh, here we go. So um, Esme's question is, if they like turf, but we are also facing the question of maintaining it as the drought worsens, what should we advocate for as far as turf best practices in public parks for magpies, of course? I, you know, it's a challenging question. Um, I think that we will see some, probably see some cutbacks in the irrigation. Um, I have not been able to really um, separate the um, relative importance of irrigated and uh, unirrigated um, uh, turf and annual grassland. I think uh, if, if the water use has to be cut back, we at least will still have uh, hopefully some maintenance that will keep the grass short and allow them uh, allow the birds to continue to forage there. It might reduce the foraging base because obviously the water uh, probably encourages some uh, uh, insect production, but um, you know it, it, it may have some effects. Um, ideally, it, it would be better, especially again, in close proximity to uh, the, um, the rivers. Um, it, to keep these areas green. These, those areas also generally are the most attractive to recreationists. And you know the, oftentimes the picnic tables, uh, the open areas are adjacent to, um, that people use are adjacent to the rivers and that might help keep things open. There's a small amount of disturbance that humans cause, but uh, magpies also uh, are some pretty adaptable and uh, and seem to do well around people. You know, they we even see them foraging in garbage cans in some of the picnic areas in the parks here. Okay, well, thank you, Dan. Uh, we have a question now from Ron, and Ron is asking, why don't they nest near golf courses? The the short answer is I'm not positive, um, but I have several ideas. One is um, that golf courses are managed much more intensively. And uh, I, you have a lot of fertilizer, you have uh, pesticides being used, although I don't know the details. And you have um, you know, much more frequent mowing. And uh, so that may make them less productive for foods that, that magpies feed on. One of the things that you'll notice when you, if you watch magpies forage is they really like to flip over leaves. 
And so, you know, leaves fall on the turf and I think insects gather underneath them for cover. And they're actually a specialist at walking along and flipping over a leaf and grabbing what's under it. And, you know, so well, really well-maintained turf areas, including golf courses, may have less food. A second thing is just disturbance. You know, the people playing through and golf carts and such cause them to have to fly up and wait for them to go by. And so they're losing foraging time. And a third possibility, um, what is my third possibility? Um, oh, that it's dangerous, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you might get hit. Um, and killed. And, you know, magpies are smart. And, uh, you know, there, there are stories of magpies holding funerals for one another. They're social, they're smart. Uh, so there may be some cultural aversion to dangerous situations like uh, being around a, you know, 90 mile an hour flying golf ball. All right. Thank you, Dan. We have um, uh, three different questions that have just come in. Um, the first of the three is from Kathy, who asks, how can the impact of music festivals be mitigated? Can the organizers be persuaded to hold the festivals when they are not reproducing? We, you know, uh, we have been um, thinking hard about this. And um, uh, let me give you a little rundown of some of our thinking about this festival. I was approached with this by one of the, the, I should say, the resource manager for Sacramento County Parks. And to her credit, she was concerned about this festival being held at Discovery Park, which uh, if, if you think about that line of dots on the map, that was the top one. That was the one that has, uh, uh, has 98 pairs nesting at the park this year. Um, and, you know, the first instinct is to say, oh, we just can't do it. Um, but we had those festivals have been conducted for, you know, 15 or 20 years. And it's only in the last two years due to COVID that they were, um, they were canceled. So we don't know if the population there last year and this year is a response to the lack of a festival or whether they have been tolerating the festival. So what we did, we decided, and, and I should tell you, these festivals generate something on the order of like $20 million in one weekend to the Sacramento economy. It's a really big deal for vendors, hotels, restaurants. And, um, you know, to stand up and say, well, I don't really have any data, but uh, I think you should cancel the festival. And by the way, this species isn't even listed as a you know, threatened or endangered species, it really wasn't going to go anywhere. And so what we did is we said, well, let's at least evaluate what happens. And so we have begun surveys uh, prior to the uh, concert, during the setup period for the concert, where there's a lot of activity, during the concert itself, in, during the demobilization of all of the concert, and then following the concert. And we are going to look at numbers of birds using various areas that have different levels of use and seeing whether the birds were able to find a place to forage, whether they foraged less, um, or, or they just had to move somewhere else. And um, we and one specific mitigation measure that we did do is identify an area of, of taller grasses that the county mowed that was outside of the concert uh, boundary so that birds at least had that area to go to to forage uh, if, uh, you know, when they were deprived of a portion of the park. So as I said, that data came in yesterday and actually we're still collecting the post-concert data. Um, and, but I'll, I think the initial indication is the concert didn't start until one o'clock in the afternoon. And what we saw is at the second day, a lot of birds were down foraging that second day uh, in the morning. And I think what happened is they weren't able to forage in the afternoon before, but they got down there and they, and they did their best uh, the morning before the concert started. Uh, the, you know, the use levels actually went up that morning from what they had been normally, probably because they were compressed to using a shorter time period. 
So we don't know the answer. One last thing that we will look at is we're going to compare the reproduction of, of the birds because after they fledge young, we can count the number of young per pair and compare that per reproduction with per reproduction in other parks that didn't have concerts and determine whether you know, the numbers were uh, affected, a uh, number of young fledged. Uh, because of or at the site where the concert was held. So we're trying to get as many indications as we can as to whether this is a big deal or not. The last thing I will say is, again, even if it causes an effect, remember when we stopped the con when they stopped the concerts during COVID, there were large numbers of birds. So they should be able to recover from a temporary effect in one year, even if it happens. I'm sorry if that was such a long answer. Well, thank you, Dan. Our next question is from Nancy Gilmore, and uh, here's what she says. I grew up in Stockton. In the 1970s, we never used to see yellow-billed magpies north of Modesto nor south of Merced, but then it seemed that their range expanded in both directions. Is that true or no? I don't know. Nancy probably knows more than I do about it. Um, I, I don't work too much in down in that part of the valley. I'm mostly either working around Sacramento or up in the foothills between Tuolumne County and Placer County. Um, I have not heard about a range expansion, um, but it may be that there has been some local uh, increase that might have occurred. If I were to guess, I would say it would might be in response to planting of trees and the growth of trees that provided nesting habitats in areas where they otherwise might not be available could also be related to some sort of crop change. And, you know, use of various crops by magpies is a really important uh, subject that we know nothing about. There's no quantitative information. I did attempt to get a study going with uh, Stanislaus Audubon this year along the Tuolumne River, but um, it just didn't quite it just didn't quite work out. Um, so that's something that is uh, in need of study. You know, are, are certain crops more or less amenable to magpie use? Okay. Well, thank you, Dan. Uh, next question is from Larry. Uh, he asks, have any studies of black-billed magpies been done to see if their habits, preferred areas, populations, and nesting habits are similar to the yellow-billed magpies? Yes, I, you know, I'm not an expert on the black billed magpie and I haven't read extensively in the literature, but I think that the black billed magpie has been uh, studied more. I can say from my personal experience that um, the range of habitat conditions that black billed magpies occupy is really quite um, impressive. Um, I, you see them. Uh, on the borders of conifer forests in Washington, you know, on out into the driest uh, Great Basin desert areas. Um, I think that they're, I'm, I'm going out on a limb here, but I think their dependence on water might be a little less than, uh, than for yellow bill magpies. You know, they nest in shrubs. They often use spiny shrubs uh, for their nest sites, which I've seen a lot in Lassen County where I lived at one time. Um, so it, it's, there's a lot of similarities, but there are some differences in that bird, and it, it seems to be fairly successful. Uh, I have not heard about, it, it had some West Nile uh, issues, but because it occupies a drier environment, I think it has less, uh, has had less effects than for the yellow bill magpie. Well, thank you, Dan. Our next question is from Ron Martin, and he asks, are the inner nest pockets lined with feathers? No, no, they are uh, they are lined with very very fine grass. Um, I mean, it, it, the grasses. At first, I thought that they were horsetail hairs because they're so thin, and it's kind of amazing to me that they carry those up. I I don't know if they carry them in a group or one by one. They're so small. Uh, so thin, you can't really see them uh, being carried, um, but they're very fine and just wrapped, uh, you know, wrapped around the inside of that mud nest. So no feathers. I will, I will mention one other thing that when you're looking at nests, um, 
you know, sometimes people mistake squirrel nests for magpie nests. Magpie nests never have leaves in them. And squirrel nests all, almost always, at least fox squirrels, is, which is what we primarily see around here, the non-native eastern fox squirrel, they always have leaves kind of woven into the stick structure, probably to reduce the, uh, you know, the flow of air because those nests are used in the wintertime. Magpie nests are used in the summer and they, you know, they want air to, to flow through to, uh, to cool them. So they have a different structure and it's pretty readily identified. You know, I might I might mention one related thing to to nests. I'm I'm kind of going down a rabbit hole here, but um, you know, one thing that uh, I mentioned about the domes on magpie nests, and that's something that you can observe uh, that many of the nests persist from year to year, but the domes generally do not. And so, determining if a nest is active or not, or if it's a magpie nest, can be can be that determination can be made based on whether the dome is in place or not uh, as you go into the, you know, the heart of the nesting season, which would be April, May. Thank you, Dan. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions at the moment. Let me just check one more time to make sure that's still correct. Oh, here we go. Oh, here's this is an interesting question from Kathy. How much do magpies weigh? I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, I could guess, I could guess. I would say, you know, it's a big bird, but it's mostly feathers and tail. I, I you know, I, I don't know. I would guess on the order of like 12, 14 ounces, maybe 16 ounces. Um, it's, that's readily available in the birds of the world account, um, but it's just not something, I've never had one in the hand. They're tough to catch. It would be a lot of fun to get some uh, color bands on them. Oh, you know, can I tell you one more fun fact while I mention it, while I think of it? Um, the, you know, one thing that I'm seeing this year, my daughters adopted a cat, and I am not a pet person, but they adopted a cat and then dumped it on my wife and I when they went back to school, and we've been feeding this cat outside, and the magpies have, you know, again, they're smart. They have learned to come and eat that cat food. And I've started talking to people and found that it's a very widespread phenomenon in urban areas that magpies are using uh, pet food uh, as a source of food. And in fact, I've even seen magpies entering a, uh, you know, one of these feral cat colonies, which, you know, are like the bane of my existence. Um, but they actually go in there and eat the pet food and drink the water. Um, that's put out for these feral cat colonies. So, you know, we, we tend to think of, uh, you know, what could possibly be good about a feral cat colony, but that's the, but that colony is the only source of water for one of those colonies uh, that I found uh, in one area. And so perhaps it was keeping that, that group of birds alive. And, and I will say the cats do not want to mess with magpies or vice versa, it appears. So I don't think they're a grave danger, but that's based on a sample size of one cat who's 13 years old. So further study required. <laughs> okay, so we had uh, two people comment that according to Sibley, um, yellow-billed magpies weigh 5.2 ounces. And then wow. uh, we have another question again from Nancy Gilmore and she asks, do yellow-billed magpies mate for life? I mean, first of all, 5.2 ounces seems so small, doesn't it? It's amazing that a bird that large would only weigh, you know, six ounces, but it goes to show you. Do they mate for life? Um, I don't know. I'm sure that information is available, but again, without color banded birds, uh, which I, I, I don't have, I haven't observed and I wouldn't have any way of observing uh, whether they made it for life. I don't know whether, I don't remember that the studies uh, done in the Central Coast had color bands, so that might be something that's not known. It, it would not surprise me, though, at all, I'll say. In fact, if I had to bet, I would say that they probably do, because they're so social, and their social bonds 
extend throughout the year. Um, you know, they're foraging in groups in fall, winter, spring, and then they kind of break up a little bit to mate, uh, to, to raise young, and then immediately go back into a big group. So one would think that, you know, the, the, uh, that both members of the pair would join the same group and probably persist over time. That's my guess. Okay, so we have um, Kathy here. She says, thank you, and also asks, can you share more about the funerals? Well, I've never seen it, and I've kind of looked for it. Um, but, you know, one good thing is, you know, I actually expected to find a bunch of dead birds by being out as I was, um, because a lot of a lot of dead magpies are reported. Um, but I never, I never found one. And again, sort of, you know, anecdotal evidence that we aren't seeing a lot of uh, uh, mortality in this population, in these populations near in the urban areas near water. Um, I don't know too much about the funerals, but but I have heard that um, basically the group will come around and and. Um, display, I guess is the best word I can say, around a dead uh, magpie. And, and sometimes it's even been reported oddly around like a single feather that is uh, on the ground. Um, so, you know, they're social, they're smart. Um, I, I'm not going to discount, um, you know, sort of what that means um, and, and why they do it. It appears that they know each other and, uh, you know, who knows? It, they may actually be capable of experiencing some form of grief and, ex and are expressing that. I wouldn't have said that 10 years ago, but my kind of my, uh, my views on, on animals and animal intelligence, you know, has been affected by some of the recent research that has shown uh, that birds are more than uh, feathered lizards, uh, as as we learned in ornithology when I took it 40 years ago. Well, thank you, Dan. Let's see if we have any additional questions. Uh, looks like for the moment, uh, we don't have any additional questions. So um, I'm going to kind of go ahead and so it's 8 o'clock. So I'm going to kind of go ahead and start shutting things down a little bit. And if anyone has any additional questions, go ahead and throw them in there. And I'll uh, check the chat once again um, before uh, before we log off. So I just want to say thank you, Dan, uh, for the wonderful presentation. And I apologize to you because I think I um, mispronounced your last name a little bit earlier. So, so I apologize for that. <laughs> Uh, that happens about 50% of the time, Rachel. Don't worry about it. I answer to anything. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no, oh, thank asks, thank you so it? much. You did a great job of um, moderating there. And I appreciate all the really good questions. You know, it helps me to uh, to be peppered with different ideas. Uh, and and some of this I think I can, I'll think about and uh, perhaps incorporate in the work we do uh, going forward. So. Awesome. Do you have yeah. another question? This uh, this actually is something that you brought up earlier in the presentation, um, and that is, what is the other endemic species to California? <laughs> I cheated, and I googled it. So. Oh, okay. Sure does does know. anyone know who, on the honor system without googling? You can put it in the chat. I guessed wrong when when I I learned that fact, and I I guessed uh, the California gnat catcher, but the California gnat catcher occurs in Baja California, so that doesn't count. Anybody? It's it's a little bit of a trick question, sort of. Yep, there it is, the island scrub jay, which was recognized uh, as uh, initially it was a uh, you know a subspecies of the uh, wet, of the western scrub jay, but it has split been split out as its own separate species now. And of course, it's not only endemic just. To California, it's endemic to the uh, Cat the island, uh, Catalina Islands, or two of them, I believe. And it's still a lifer I don't have. I need to get out there. Wow, okay, so we have, uh, well, we don't have any other questions at the moment, but we do have some compliments. Um, Iris, okay, and Nancy Gilmore says, <laughs> really interesting talk, thank you. Um, Iris says, magpies are one of my favorite birds. Thank you for the wonderful talk. And Kathy says, thank you very much. 
All right. Well, thank you again, everyone who attended. Uh, we certainly appreciate it. Thank you, Dan, for the wonderful and highly informative presentation. Um, if you're not already, everyone, please follow Fresno Audubon on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, we have also relaunched our YouTube channel. So if you want to view this presentation again or any of our um, other recent um, general meetings uh, from the past year or so, you can find those on there. Um, we do hope that you'll join us for next month's general meeting, uh, which is scheduled for June 14th, if I'm not mistaken, and Lily Douglas will be talking to us about the uh, Central Valley Joint Venture and creating a habitat for migrating birds uh, for here in the Central Valley. So stay tuned for an announcement to, um, for that event and links to registration. So uh, with that, uh, have a great remainder of your week and stay safe out there, everybody. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Right. Good evening, everyone. <laughs>